Hi, how are you all doing? Slides have miraculously changed. Um, so welcome, it's really great to be here. Um, just to pay the compliment back, really. So I'm a big fan of Action for Happiness, um, based in Brighton, and um, we have our own much smaller version of um, these Action for Happiness uh, meetups down in Brighton. So it's nice to be kind of on, on the other side of that uh, and being um, uh, the person who gets to share some stuff with you today uh, rather than the, always the person listening. Uh, so uh, nice to be able to share a little bit of kind of my story and, uh, and what I do as part of my job with Think Productive. Um, I've called this Beyond Busy um, principally because I think, as Mark was saying, sometimes the whole idea of productivity can be a little bit alienating. And I'm going to try and make it my challenge this evening to um, get away from uh, that whole sort of mentality of the guru and the expert who is perfect and knows everything and become much more about how do we, as humans, get beyond this notion of busy. It was really interesting, like, walking here through... I came up through Holborn Tube and out of Holborn Station, and just that whole area is, just feels like everybody is frenetic and busy. Uh, and it's also the start of the year where a lot of people do start to think about plans and productivity and how you want to do things differently and habits and all that stuff. So I'm really hoping that some of what I say tonight will be timely um, for you guys as well. Um, as Mark was saying... Uh, I have a book called How to Be a Productivity Ninja. Um, I also have a podcast called uh, Beyond Busy, where I talk about work-life balance and happiness and how people define success. And I'll talk a bit, uh, a little bit more about that, that part of uh, my work later. Uh, my company is called Think Productive, so we run a whole range of workshops uh, in, a, in a whole bunch of companies, not just in the UK, but around the world as well. So that's kind of the little kind of background of me and what I do. So what I'm going to do this evening is divide this up into three different sections, and the first one is called the attention bit. So Mark said at the beginning that really the only uh, thing that we all have in common is we have the same number of hours in our day, and you know, time is our most precious resource. I would go one step further than that and say that time is actually not our most precious resource. Attention is our most precious resource. And how we choose to spend that attention, and particularly how we choose to spend the quality parts of our attention, those two to three hours of what I call proactive attention, where we have really good energy and we're really well set up to do great work, um, I think really defines us in terms of productivity. So how, how do we get the best out of those times where we have the best energy and we're best set up to be productive? Um, so who, just by a show of hands, has been on some kind of time management course before, just by a show of hands? Keep your hand in the air if everything is now perfect and it's all sorted. <laughs> Um, and I think this is the thing. I think for me, you know, uh, time, everybody has the same number of, number of hours, but actually how we use our really precious attention, how, how do we really use the, the best energy um, that we have? I think we have two to three hours a day of that time. Um, so I think for me, it's about how do we deal with that, that, that problem of attention? How do we make sure that we uh, do everything possible to avoid the distractions that can take away our time, take away uh, that resource? And so what I've done is developed kind of nine different characteristics, nine different ways of thinking about attention and different, really different lenses to look at our work and different lenses also to look at our life, um, to think about different ways to really think about our attention. So I'm going to talk particularly around um, five or six of these uh, this evening. I'm going to give you some chances as we go through this in our three little bits to uh, do some uh, conversation with the person next to you just to kind of work out where you feel like you stand with these as well. Um, so we've got zen-like calm right through to human, not superhero. And I'm going to start with zen-like calm. So when I'm doing this work around productivity, one of the things that comes up a lot is this question of, like, when were you most productive? And often the answer that people give to that question, if you think about it for yourselves right now, like, when were you most productive? When were you last really productive? When did you have a time when you really felt like you're on top of things? Often people say it was when I was on deadline. And so I'm on this deadline, and suddenly, you know, I, everything just like sprang into place, and everything went really well, and I had this really great moment. And you know, often this notion of the deadline is seen as being the thing that gets us to being productive. It's actually not the deadline really that makes us productive. It's the fact that the deadline forces this sense of zen-like calm, and what psychologists refer to as flow. So when you're on a deadline, what happens is, you know, everything else falls away. You're not thinking about what you're going to eat when you get home. You're not thinking about your email inbox. You're not thinking about the 50 other things that you could do that day. It's just you and that piece of work that you're doing, that report, that idea, whatever it is you're working on, and you've got to deliver it by that set time. And it's like, you know right now, in this moment, this is the most important thing that I could do right now. And so for me, that's where Zen Like Calm really kicks in. It's about being in the moment, being in that state of flow. 
And you know, the deadline really helps you to get there because it's like, I'm on this deadline, I've got to do it. But my contention is deadlines are really expensive. You know, once you start to uh, live your life by deadline after deadline after deadline, you start to feel very busy. You probably don't feel that happy. And also, it starts to lead to the risk of burnout, you know, if you're just constantly chasing deadlines all the time. So how do you get to this sense of zen-like calm, this sense of flow, being able to be in the moment, really focused, without the need for deadline after deadline after deadline? And for me, that's about quality thinking. It's about how do we get to a really good sense of, of perspective around what we're working on, a really clear sense of priorities, and do probably a little bit more thinking around that stuff than we're used to doing. So just want to... Uh, give you the opposite idea. I think a lot of the people that I uh, work with, and I have this, uh, this sense of uh, dread and overwhelm myself too, uh, no one is immune from this, um, this idea of being in the moment and in flow and totally focused, it's just not that easy. There are so many things that get in the way of that. There are so many things that bombard us. Um, and what's difficult about the idea of busy, and I really do think being busy is a state of mind, um, what's difficult about the state of busy is that the mind does not discriminate, it just knows that there's loads of things going on. So on all these different post-it notes, you've got really small things like pick up milk and really big things on there too. And actually, the mind just knows there are lots of different things to do. Um, David Allen, who wrote a book called Getting Things Done, has this phrase, the mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. So the brain is really not a good place to try and retain lots of information. And if you start to do that, you'll feel very busy, and it's very difficult to feel in that sense of flow and, and zen-like calm as a result of that. So getting all of these things out of your head, having some other way of being able to manage all the different commitments that you have, not just in your work, but in your life too, is really key to getting away from this sense of feeling busy and also getting this focus around the work that you do. It didn't used to be this complicated. So um, Peter Drucker, who was a, a management guru and economist, had this um, uh, narrative around... Uh, the, the move from the industrial age into, into the information age. So moving from an idea where people worked with their hands to an idea where people work with their brains. Um, most of you in this room are probably knowledge workers, right? So what that means is you add value and you create value out of information in some way or another. That means you're a knowledge worker. Um, and in the industrial age, it, you know, it just work was a little bit different. So if you worked in the kind of job like this, where you walk into the cake factory and there's a big conveyor belt, and coming down the conveyor belt with all these different cakes, you've got a big box of cherries, and your job is you put one cherry on each cake. That's an industrial age job. It's really simple what your function is. You have to perform that function, putting the cherry on the cake. If the conveyor belt goes faster, you go faster. If the conveyor belt stops, you just wait. There's nothing else for you to do. This is your job, putting cherries on cakes. How many people in that job, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, you would go home Friday evening and think, oh, the cherries today. <laughs> it went crazy. Um, <laughs> or maybe you'd be sat there on a Sunday evening going, I have no idea how next week's going to go. It's just going to, you know. <laughs> so you might have a really good idea of, um, you know, in that job, what does success look like? What does done look like? You know, it's really easy to, because it's so well defined, uh, to see that you're being successful in that job. Um, but actually the problem that we have in the jobs that we do now is that we are simultaneously the boss and the worker all at the same time. So as well as putting cherries on cakes. It's like you're in the cake factory putting cher on cherries on cakes, but everyone's in your ear going, what time should the shift start tomorrow? And how fast should the conveyor belt go? And let's think about what's going on in the outside world, which is everyone's talking about healthy eating, so should we ditch the cakes completely and use these cherries to make fruit cocktail instead? <laughs> you know, so you're having to do all that intuitive judgment thinking, problem solving, and you know, using your judgment on stuff and defining the task as well as actually putting cherries on cakes. Because all of you in this room, you put cherries on cakes too, right? So you send the emails, you set up the meetings, you deliver the reports, you do all that stuff. That's like you putting the cherries on cakes. But we're simultaneously the boss and the worker all at the same time. And what I think this means is that we, in order to get into this state of zen-like calm much more regularly, is we really need to be well-defined in that boss mode, in defining what our work looks like, defining what success looks like for us, as well as to the people around us and just being really clear in the thinking that we do on that. And there's some, some frameworks and systems that I'll, I'll talk about a bit later, and I talk about in a lot of detail in the book, that will help you to think much more clearly and just look at the work that you're doing in, with a much greater sense of perspective. Um, Henry Ford has this lovely quote, which is, thinking is the hardest work there is, which is the probable reason so few engage in it, <laughs> which I really like. So I'm going to follow this idea of zen-like calm um, with a very opposite energy, uh, which is ruthlessness. 
I think when I put this slide up, what often happens is people start to conjure up images in their head of uh, the sort of Gordon Gecko in, in Wall Street, or you know, with greed is good, or um, Leonardo DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street, like bowling with dwarves and all that sort of thing. Um, and this is not what I'm talking about with uh, uh, this particular image at all. So I'm not at all talking about being ruthless with other people. I'm not talking about being mean and nasty and horrible. Um, I don't think that is very conducive to happiness. <laughs> Certainly not in the long term. Um, but I think we have to be really ruthless with ourselves. And we have to be really ruthless around how we um, set up our work, what we allow into, uh, you know, like into our own brains, into our attention, and what, what do we screen out and keep out, and how, how do we kind of say no as often as possible to the stuff that might be quite worthwhile doing, but isn't the greatest stuff that's going to change the world. Um, so, you know, really lowering our expectations. Um, there's a few studies that uh, I've seen which, you know, like in all the studies about how people live their lives, and probably... I, I know some of the studies that Action for Happiness will reference will be like this as well. It's always like the Scandinavian countries that seem to just have everything like nailed and really good. Um, and there was a study a little while ago that said, a couple of studies I saw that said, um, how do you uh, live with less stress? And it turned out that the Scandinavian countries, the way that they live with a lot of stress was they just lowered their expectations. <laughs> and it's as simple as that. You know? So really lowering your expectations about uh, what do you let onto your plate? What do you let into your attention? And what that means is learn to, learning to say no much more effectively and much more often. Um, Warren Buffett has a quote, which is, um, the difference between successful people and really successful people is that the really successful people say no to almost everything. We have to be ruthless with ourselves, too. Um, I think, uh, just by a show of hands, who feels like sometimes they might procrastinate with their work? Yeah you've, yeah, you've taken the first step. You've admitted it. It's good, right? We can now identify the change and move forward. Um, so I think, you know, for me, being ruthless around um, your own habits and your own procrastination, noticing the times in the day or the particular habits that you have that are likely to, to derail you and take you away from doing great work or spending really quality time with your family or whatever you might be doing, like procrastination doesn't really discriminate between work and life. It just gets in the way of everything. Um, so getting really ruthless around that stuff and, and working out how to change those habits, um, I think, is really huge. Um, and finally, just to talk about ruthlessness, I think we have to be ruthless with our attention. I mentioned at the beginning that um, in the book I talk about this idea of proactive attention, the two to three hours of time in the day where we're most switched on, we have the best energy, and we can do the best work. And guess what? That is, you know, for most people, when they've done studies on this, it tends to be most people have that time in the morning rather than the afternoon. Most people are kind of more morning people than afternoon people. There are, of course, exceptions to that. If you're sitting, sat going, that's not me. Um, but when you think about what happens in the morning, that tends to be when you're sat in somebody else's boring meeting. Or you're sat there with your email inbox, and there's loads of emails come overnight, and it's just like, it just feels like such a, a drudgery to try and to go through all the stuff that's in there. So it's very easy to use that proactive attention time either for someone else's priorities, um, you know, which is the meeting, or someone else's priorities, which is the email too. Right? So really like recognizing that we have to defend that, and our attention will get scrambled if we don't uh, really take steps to uh, remove all of those different distractions, you know, whether that's like other people, whether that's the things on our phone. There are so many other things that will just derail us and take away um, that, that kind of sense of having our own control over our, and autonomy over our attention. Um, so those are our first two characteristics out of nine. I'm going to leave the others on the screen just so you can uh, have a look at that. But th that's the end of the first bit. So what I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you, um, say hello if you don't know them, and then just spend a couple of minutes just talking about those two ideas. So Zen Like Calm, this idea of getting in the moment, getting in a, sen in a sense of flow with your work, and being able to really make the space psychologically um, to do great work or to spend really quality time. And this idea of ruthlessness, so being ruthless with ourselves around procrastination, being ruthless with defending that attention, uh, and, and just being ruthless in, in that kind of way as well. So uh, Zen Like Calm and Ruthlessness, just give you five minutes just to chat those two ideas through. Off you go. Right, okay. <laughs> wow, that got you chatting, didn't it? Wow, cool. Uh, right, so we're going to move on and do the geeky bit now. Um, so we've done uh, at the beginning the attention bit. We're now going to do the geeky bit. Um, and so I think 
For Productivity Ninjas, one of the most obvious things that we need to have is weapons, right? If you're going to be a ninja, you need some weapons. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about technology and some of the things that can uh, really help and boost your productivity and also some of the pitfalls of technology as well. Um, so um, that is just a bunch of different apps and stuff that you can get on your phone. I'm going to talk about a couple of them um, that can just really help generally with productivity. Um, just by a show of hands in the room, like who has at least one of those apps on your phone already? Just so I can get a bit of a sense. Cool. Put your hand down if it's Evernote and keep your hand up if it's not. Okay, so most people have Evernote. Uh, who's got a non-Evernote app just by a show of hands? Okay, so there's still quite a few. Cool. Um, oh, there's Outlook on there as well, right? That doesn't, yeah. <laughs> Put your hand on if it's not Outlook either. I forgot about that bit. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, I think for me, one of the things is that uh, often with productivity apps, people get very um, snobby about things like Microsoft Outlook or stuff that has been around for a long time because they think, oh, what's the latest and the coolest and newest tool that I need to be using? What's the cutting edge of stuff? Um, and the other thing that happens quite a lot is I'll go in and, and uh, before I've even started to do my talk with an organization, someone will come up to me and say, cool, productivity, great. What app do I need to download? As if like, it's that easy, like, you just download an app and then it's all done. Um, and so I have this like, little um, sort of motto, which is that um, when it comes to, to productivity, psychology comes before technology. So psychology and then technology rather than the other way around. Um, so I think being weapon savvy is about thinking about what, what is the utility of all these different devices and apps and everything anyway. I think often what can happen is we get too obsessed with the devices, we get addicted to our email or our phone, we get obsessed with the idea of the new shiny uh, you know, solution that's going to change our world. And actually, I don't think it's that simple. I think we really have to come at these things with, with a lot of intention at the very beginning. Um, so I think obviously Outlook, Outlook and Evernote on there are, are very uh, common things. Um, who uses some kind of a password manager, just by a show of hands? So some of you, so those of you who are not using a password manager, do you ever get frustrated because you've forgotten the password to stuff, right? So, um, so there's like LastPass and 1Password and these different apps where you basically just put, uh, you just have one password that you have to remember. So you do have to remember one, um, but then the app will remember all the others and it will even auto fill in all those things on different apps as well. So LastPass, 1Password, um, very, very cheap, like a few dollars. And I save so much time because I have a really bad memory. But that's just a really nice, uh, simple uh, thing to start using an app for. Um, what a few of these relate to, so um, in particular, you've got Nosby on there and, and uh, Todoist. And there are some other really good apps uh, called things like Remember the Milk as well. All these are to-do list apps, right? So um, Nosby, Todoist, Remember the Milk, uh, Wonderlist. These are really good uh, to-do list app tools. What they uh, basically do is allow you to take all that stuff out of your brain. Um, so that back to our little kind of post-it note guy, um, just overwhelmed with lots of stuff. Dump all that into an app and then start to be able to play around with it, move it around, make sense of it when it's in front of you. So um, in psychology, they call this distributed cognition, which is basically get all the stuff out of your head and once you can see it in front of you, it's much easier to think about it. Simple as that. So if you've ever been in that state of... Uh, about to be, you're about to go on holiday or you're about to be away from work for a few days and then you write down a big list and you're really stressed and then suddenly by the fact that you've written the list down, you suddenly just feel loads better about it. That's distributed, just distributed cognition too. Um, so that's just being able to manipulate the data, being able to see stuff in front of you rather than carrying all the stuff in your head just makes a huge difference. Um, so a ninja really needs a second brain. So our own brain is great for doing creative thinking and problem solving, just not that great for holding all that information not just our to-do list, but also the projects that those things relate to, when they've got to be done, all that stuff. So holding that stuff in a second brain, the one I use is called Nosby. Um, this is just the, the most useful app that you can get. So if you're going to um, use an app for anything, if you just want to use one app, that would be the, the way I would go, is really think about your, the idea of the second brain and some kind of way of being able to manipulate and kind of move around the data to do with your work. Um, let's talk a little bit about one of the other ninja characteristics, which is stealth and camouflage, uh, and in particular, this idea of, um, of, of being offline. So um, I have really noticed in the last five years, so the book, How to Be a Productivity Ninja, um, I was just asked to update it as a kind of five-year anniversary. And I was really thinking about what's changed in the last five years when it comes to productivity. And you know, for me, the only thing that's massively changed is the way we are addicted to devices and, you know, the, particularly the way phones just seem to pervade our attention at all times. So um, really think about how we use stuff like uh, the airport mode on phones. I've got a whole chapter in the book 
in the updated book called Stop Messing About on Your Phone, um, where I talk about some particular, yeah, I just, just thought that's the good title for the, for the chapter, right? Um, and the, the sort of key premise of that is using apps to block certain other apps on your phone. So I'm not a big fan of this idea of the digital detox or like, get rid of your smartphone and get a dumb phone and just play Snake all day on a Nokia 3210. Like, you know, come on. Like, there's some really useful stuff that, that phones will give us. But we also don't want that sense of, you know, what am I missing? What's on Instagram? What's on Twitter? Like, we don't want that kind of sense of being ruled by the devices. Um, willpower, when it comes to this stuff, is totally overrated. We have to treat ourselves like children. Um, the reason for this is pretty simple, which is the best minds in Silicon Valley spend all of their time making these things more addictive. That is literally their job. So, you know, like put one person's mind who's, you know, adequate up against the best minds collectively, um, then, you know, they're going to win, right? And they're going to get more and more of your attention. So you need to uh, not just think about this as being a willpower issue. This is, this is much bigger than that, and we have to have tactics and, and ways to deal with it. So in the chapter, um, what I talk about is... Um, Divide, basically divide how I want to spend my attention up into three different modes. So I have create mode, that's where I really want to get down and do creative work. It's where I really want to be focused on creating things, you know, whether that's doing writing, whether that's ideas, um, you know, whatever that might be. Like create is really about me getting my work done and the stuff that, that really matters for me to put out into the world. Um, then there's collaborate mode, which is principally about me helping other people to get their job done. So, you know, it's the emails, it's the meetings, it's the stuff where I'm the bottleneck, and really my job is to unhook myself from being the bottleneck and help them to deliver what they want to deliver on. So, so create mode is me heads down. Collaborate mode, much more outwardly, fo fo outwardly focused and kind of think about collaboration in the team. And the third mode is chill, because I think it's really important to not just use the dwindling remaining energy that you have left at the end of all that to, to focus on chill. So actually just having time to relax that is not just the last bit of energy that you have left. You know, actually trying to, to work out a way to, uh, to do the chill part really well and to, you know, to, to really relax fully. Uh, and just even just spending a few minutes. Like, so for me, often what that comes down to is trying to make sure there are a number of evenings where I'm either... I'm not just like messing around on YouTube or something. I'm like sitting down with a book or seeing friends or like doing stuff that feels a bit more like quality rather than just kind of wasting time uh, on my phone and scrolling and all that sort of stuff. So just really kind of thinking about that and kind of putting a, a level of sort of design into that too. Um, but yeah, you can get apps on your phone. The one I use is called Quality Time for this. Uh, what you can then do is schedule break. So when I'm in that create mode, I will not have access to Instagram. I will not have access to Google Chrome. I will not have access to Twitter. Like, all these things are blocked in that time. Um, so once I kind of figured out that I need to operate in these kind of three different modes, I can basically change my phone to only have certain things available in each of those three modes. So when it gets to the chill time, like, I can have all of that stuff available, and I can go on Instagram if I want. Um, but like, when I'm really in that kind of create mode, my phone is almost a dumb phone, but it's still doing things that are quite useful too. Um, so that's called quality time. Uh, that's on Android. If you're an iPhone person, there's an equivalent one called Off Time. There's also one called Freedom, which works across desktop and, and phones and everything else. So um, those are really useful apps to start thinking about to really uh, you know, allow ourselves to manage our attention and to, to have our phones help us rather than hinder us with all of that. Um, and I want, I want to talk just finally on this weapon savvy thing about email. Um, so I think email's certainly been um, a problem over the last five years. It was, it was a problem when... Uh, the book came out the first time around. Uh, but I think people are still really struggling with this idea of email overload. Um, in the last few years, there's been a growth in uh, this idea called Inbox Zero, the idea of getting your inbox down to zero. Uh, and then once you, some of you are going, what? Really? Are people doing that? Um, and there's also been a, a little bit of a backlash against the idea of Inbox Zero. So rather than kind of getting a sense of control around email, which is really what Inbox Zero is, um, the opposite idea is inbox infinity, which is just like, just letting it all just, you know. Um, and I think actually both of them can get you to the same place. It just depends on what your job is and what your personality type is and, and various other things. So I'm a big advocate of inbox zero. What that does not mean is I spend all day with an empty inbox waiting for the next email to come in, just like batting it away. Um, and that is... Um, actually, you know, a sort of commonly held myth around Inbox Zero. The idea, really, of Inbox Zero is that I know 
you know, because I can kind of roughly see how many emails are coming in. I, I, I know regularly I'm going to get back, back down to zero, probably most evenings, certainly every couple of days I'm going to get it back down to zero. And I also have a sense of being able to measure and manage what's in there. So I know that I can kind of get it down to zero, leave for the day. There might be a couple of emails in a folder called action, but I know what those are. I've read them. I know what the response needs to be. And I can leave knowing that there's nothing lurking in there that's like the big kind of you know, potential thing that's going to blow up on me like in two days' time if I don't deal with it. So it's just that kind of peace of mind of knowing that I'm on top of it. Um, and what I put in the book is a whole chapter called Ninja Email, which basically, uh, when people sit down with it, it takes about 45 minutes to read the chapter. And about usually for most people, between an hour and two hours, to sit down with that chapter and do nothing else other than just kind of hack through emails like a ninja. And within a couple of hours, you'll get your inbox to zero. So if you're going to sit there going, I've got 10,000, well, guess what? Cheating is fine. So most of the emails in there will be stuff that's, if you've got 10,000, will be stuff that's older than the last couple of weeks. Just put it all in one folder called the attic or the loft or whatever you want to call it. And just notice over the next few weeks, how often do you ever need that stuff? Because really the point of all of this is that email is just the medium. It's just the way we have the conversation. And I think people get very obsessed by, again, you know, it's the, the, the psychology factor of this, the kind of red lurking number, like, and it's just kind of going up and up and up, and it just kind of feels like 500 emails means 500 bits of work to do. And when it comes to email, what I've really noticed over the last few years is when I'm coaching people one-on-one um, -on -one with email, it's not the 80-20 rule, it's the 800-20 rule. Literally, and this just happened so accidentally, I was just noticed a pattern as I was coaching people where people start with 800 emails and there are 20 things in there that really matter. And really for every 800 emails, there are 20 that really matter. So if you think about it in that way and start to discount this idea of email being the center of our universe and really start to think about how can we reclaim emails so that we can get outside of the email inbox and do the stuff that really matters, which is the thinking and the conversations and the ideas and all the stuff that really makes a difference, then email becomes not so much of a big problem. And then finally, on our geeky bit, I want to talk about unorthodoxy. Um, a few years ago, I uh, conducted um, every month a different extreme productivity experiment. Uh, and I think this is really relevant to talk to an Action for Happiness audience about, because I think we all get stuck in ruts with the way that we operate, not just our work, but our lives as well. So, you know, just those habitual things, if we always get the bus around the same time, we always take the same journey, we always start our work day in the same way, we always start a Saturday morning in the same way. And we get into these kind of ruts of how we work. And I think often when we really want to um, really like help, help ourselves to define productivity or to define happiness, one of the best things you can do is just shake things up a bit, just kind of mess around and, like, and just... Uh, experiment with your own habits and experiment with the things that you do. So I did these 12 extreme productivity experiments. The idea was to go to the extreme because I think that's where often the best learning is and learn from that stuff and then bring it back into my kind of mainstream how I did stuff um, and really do extreme productivity experiments so that you all don't have to because I put them on my blog. Um, and so I did things like I did flipping the 9 to 5. So instead of working 9 to 5, I worked 5 till 9 a.m., Clocked off at 9 a.m. That was quite a good couple of weeks. I also did uh, nine to, uh, 5 to 9 p.m., so I had the whole day 9 to 5 completely free, and then 5 to 9 in the evening was my kind of work time. Uh, and what was really interesting about that was I, I, I'm someone who obsesses about productivity. I've written a book about productivity, and still I was amazed at when you have that constraint of four hours a day, how much more ruthless I was able to be, how much more actually I was getting done just by having that sense of focus around, I've only got four hours, go, 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 like, and just really using those four hours well, and then being able to then relax and, and, you know, and do better stuff outside of that as well. I also didn't, did another one, which was I worked an hour a day um, for seven days a week, so just one hour a day, but seven days a week. Uh, it turned out I was really stressed doing that, to be honest, because <laughs> uh, an hour really isn't long enough to do very much. Um, so the idea of all of these, you know, I, I think for me was just to kind of test the boundaries and test the limits of all these things. I did a month where I ate the optimum diet for productivity for a couple of weeks, and then I also uh, took part in fasting for Ramadan just to see like what that would do, like you know what happens when your blood sugar goes crazy and all of that kind of stuff. I did a month where uh, whenever I was stuck or I didn't know the answer, I would have to make the decision by the throw of dice. Right, so what that meant was I had to come up with either two different options or three different options or six different options for that particular problem. And then I had to go with whatever the dice come up with, right? So 
What was fascinating about that was when you're presented with the problem of trying to find the two or the three or the six different options, your mind actually opens up to different and more creative ways of solving the same problem. So actually what happens is you start, you know, usually we tend to think in quite a binary way, don't we? It's kind of like, I'll do it this way or that way, this or that. You know, like politics is set up like that in the West. It's like, this person's right, this person's wrong. It's like, it's all oppositional. Whereas when you start going, what are the three choices or the six choices, you start to go, oh, there's, you know, there's other possibilities here. And it just kind of forced, it, it just kind of forced me through that month to, to think about it in different ways. So just messing with all that. Um, and it also meant that I could detach the ego from decision-making. So I could go, well, it was the dice decided, it wasn't me, like, it's not my fault. Um, and that's a really interesting thing, is when you realize how fearful we are. You know, our ego is so fearful about getting things wrong and the, the sort of sense of guilt when we get things wrong um, that actually it does hold us back from making certain decisions. And um, when I did that experiment, I was often... Like, everybody that month seemed to know this Yorkshire phrase, which I've never heard before, but everyone gave it to me uh, that month, which is, you get about a third of your decisions right, and a third of your decisions wrong, and a third of them don't matter anyway. <laughs> and, you know, it's really interesting that, like, just any kind of action, any kind of decision beats indecision. So just getting started, you know, getting things going, um, just, just vital, even if you get it wrong and have to backtrack. So I just really encourage you to think about not necessarily going to those kind of extremes, but just messing around with our daily and our weekly routines. So much of what we do, we do without thinking. And just messing that up. So if you're someone who always starts your day with getting coffee and turning on the email, like maybe just have a day where you just sit there with a pen and paper, no email, and just see what that's like. And just kind of mess around with those, those really basic things. Once you start to, to shake that stuff up, you'll notice the brain starts to go to different places. You start to be more creative. And just interesting stuff can happen. Um, I also think it's a really good way to think about how to solve problems and how to communicate. It's just to think about different places to get inspiration from. One of the things I notice a lot going into corporates is that you know, if you're talking to a communications agency, they look at all the other communications agencies. What are they doing? How can we do that differently? All those kind of things. If you go into an automotive industry company, they all just look at the other cars out there and other things that are, you know, other kind of solutions to the same problems. You know. What they don't tend to do so much is to really just take inspiration from very unusual or different places. And I think I'm a great believer just that there, there's so much um, to learn from all kinds of different places. So if you're trying to solve a problem or you're trying to communicate an idea, how would a really intelligent, curious six-year-old think about this? How would another member of my family think about this? How would someone very principled, you know, with a very strong vision like Malala, how would they think about this? Um, how would I do this if it was really cheap or like really showy? You know, just kind of think about things in different ways. And obviously, Airbnb is on there. You know, the biggest hotel chain in the world. They don't own a single hotel. So, just thinking about how you do things in different ways and taking that inspiration from very unusual places. Um, I'm just a big believer that like most of the world is boring, and anything you can do just to make it a bit more unorthodox and a bit more interesting um, can just really help with a lot of stuff. And also, just thinking about gamification. So, the whole idea of Inbox Zero. Being able to measure your emails back down to zero, okay, I've got zero again. Email becomes a game, like you get the last one to zero, and it's like, yes. So how else can you gamify the boring stuff, right? So, uh, you know, whether that's kind of setting little challenges with your, with your other half or your colleague or whatever, set those little challenges, like uh, make some of those things competitive if you need to, or just like measure your success and your results around certain things. And sometimes that sense of gamifying things will just make stuff more interesting. Um, so we talked a little bit there about weapon savvy. We talked a little bit there about unorthodoxy and experimenting with our habits. And I very briefly touched on stealth and camouflage too, this idea of just making yourselves deliberately a bit less available. Um, so same drill. Um, I'm going to give it like three or four minutes, but turn to the person next to you. And what are your reflections on that? What might you change as a result of what you just heard? Go. Cool. Right, we're going to do the final bit, which is the human bit. And um, I'm going to talk about the last two characteristics, and the, the second to last one I'm going to talk about is mindfulness. When I first wrote How to Be a Productivity Ninja about five, six years ago, I, for a long time, was not writing the book. So I was running my business, Think Productive, and every week I would look at my to-do list and my project list and 
there'd be a big thing on there that would just say, write book. <laughs> and every week I'd go, still not doing that, what's happening? <laughs> and I realized that something radical needed to happen in order for me to make that shift and create the space to be able to write a book. It turns out books are really hard. Um, and what that looked like for me at that time was realizing that the, the biggest problem, the biggest thing that was holding me back was this sense of having so many other things clouding my attention. So what I did was I left the, the uh, people around me uh, in, in my team to basically run the business. I kind of gave them all the stuff that I was doing and kind of uh, taught them how to do the last kind of few remaining things. And then I booked a plane ticket to Sri Lanka and went and lived in a beach hut for about five or six weeks. Yeah, tough, right? I know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and um, this was, a, again, a very extreme measure. But what it meant was I lived in this place with no Wi-Fi, very little connectivity to the outside world. This is only back in, like, 2011. Um, and really, you know, like, my only way of phoning home was one of those, like, very cheap phones where to text, uh, to text C, you have to press it three times, you know, one of those. <laughs> uh, so, like, you don't want to do that too much because it just takes a long time. Um, so I felt quite a lot of isolation while I was uh, writing the book, but, and I didn't have that many conversations with people. But um, one of the people I met was a Buddhist monk who I met at the bus stop. And he got chatting to me about what he did and invited me to, to his Buddhist monastery, which was only like a few kilometers away. And he taught me meditation. And I'd done bits of meditation before. I live in Brighton. That's kind of how it goes. <laughs> Um, but I don't think I'd ever really experienced it properly. And uh, when I started to learn it, I found it a very profound experience. It, it really helped me to, uh, to notice what was going on in my own brain, to really think about my attention in quite a different way. I had no intention of putting this stuff in the book at all. And then just the more I was doing it and the more I was learning uh, from this Buddhist monk, the more I thought, actually, it has to be one of the characteristics. So there was going to be eight characteristics. There was now nine because mindfulness became something that I really had to talk about in the book. And then I had this whole thing of, I'm going to take this stuff back to my corporate clients, and this is so risky, because it's so hippie woo woo and I'm walking into all these corporates, and I'm talking about mindfulness. And what's really interesting over the last five years is that the opposite is now true, is that mindfulness now feels like this huge saturation thing. Everyone knows about it. Everyone's sick of these things on uh, Instagram and Twitter, which is like, to be a great leader, just meditate for five minutes a day. And it's like... Oh, if only it was that easy. Right, OK. Um, so I think there's a cynicism that often goes with meditation. There's um, also a sense that, uh, for many people, it, it just feels like a very difficult thing to do. Everyone's aware of you know, things like the app Headspace and Budify and, and, and some of those kind of key apps. But it's nevertheless not always that easy. I think there are so many ways that we can be mindful. So if meditation is not for you, um, I think yoga is, uh, for me, often a, a slightly more accessible way of getting to that same uh, sort of sense of mindfulness. Um, but also just going for a walk in the countryside, dancing, cooking, all these things will really help you to, uh, you know, to just kind of put your brain in a slightly different place, to not feel just overloaded and addicted to your phone and, and addicted to technology and all that stuff, and just create mental space where you can start to notice your thoughts, start to feel a lot more mindful. Um, and I think this is really vital for productivity. Um, when I did my uh, extreme productivity experiments, one of them was actually uh, meditating for the first 10 minutes of every hour and then watching what happened in the next 50 minutes in terms of productivity. My focus went through the roof when I did that particular month. Just 10 minutes of the hour, you know, just in terms of that sense of starting your brain fresh again. It's almost like rebooting the computer, I think and just being able to then go into that next 15 minutes with a real kind of sense of purpose. And it's the same, you know, if you're really bogged down in something at work, you just take a step back and go put the kettle on, go and have a little walk around the desk, around the office, whatever, and come back to your desk, like, right, where was I? It just suddenly seems like you have a, a greater sense of perspective and, and kind of sense of stepping back to be able to do that. So I think mindfulness can really help. And one of the things I think it really helps with is procrastination. So uh, we all have this thing in the back of our brains called the amygdala, often referred to as the lizard brain. Uh, the amygdala is also, it's the same principle, um, if you come across the book The Chimp Paradox, so he talks about the chimp, the chimp is basically also the amygdala, so this idea of the evolutionary part of, of your brain that is the fight or flight, it's kind of hunger, sex, territory, you know, the stuff that we really need for survival, it's not logic and creativity and compassion and kindness, um, it's the stuff that we really need for survival. And it's that part of the brain that is very dominant because it's the part of the brain that we really need in order to, to survive and evolve. Um, but it's also that part of the brain that really derails us in terms of procrastination often. 
So if you think about the time where you're about to stand up in front of colleagues and like give a big talk, or if you're sat there and you're about to press send on that email and you know it's going to kind of explode the world, and it's like, you know, people are, what are people going to think when I send this, right? Like there's that kind of moment that we have. Um, what will often happen is the lizard brain in that moment will start having a little dialogue with you, which goes something like, no, 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 don't do this, don't stand up there, like. You're going to be judged, right? And so what the lizard brain really fears is a sense of judgment, a threat, um, as a sense of being outcast from the tribe. Like when we start to, to view the lizard brain in that kind of way, it's really obvious where a lot of that, that procrastination comes from. It comes from the fact that we're humans and we're a bit scared. And sometimes we need to notice that and recognize that in order to be able to override it and do something different, make different decisions. Um, I'll give you an example of this. When I was about to release my book for the first time, I remember spending one whole evening, like four or five hours, uh, looking at every one-star Amazon review of every other business book I could find. <laughs> Why am I doing that? Right? It's completely insane. But it's my lizard brain basically going, look at the consequences. Don't release this out there into the world. <laughs> and you probably all have your, your similar versions of that that you can start to think about. But noticing where those thoughts come from, noticing where the fear is in the work that we do, and I think you can even do this with your to-do list. Like tomorrow morning, when you look at your to-do list, scan down each item, think about it for a couple of seconds, and notice where there's one that either changes your brain or changes your body into a little bit of a wince, like, ooh, that, that. And it, you know, it's not always write a book or something really huge. It could be as simple as, I've got to make a really awkward three-minute phone call. And it just feels tense. It just feels like something that you don't want to do. And so recognizing that there's procrastination from that, doing that first, you know, the, the, the old kind of Brian Tracy thing of eat that frog, like do the most difficult thing first, the rest of the day is just plain sailing from there. But recognizing that that's where a lot of that stuff comes from. It's this idea of the, the lizard brain holding us back and, and giving us that sense of fear. We need to move away from that. And, and the first step really is, is noticing those thoughts. I think mindfulness can really help with that. I also think mindfulness is um, really useful just to get a sense of perspective. Um, I'd really like you to just, I'd like to invite you over the next few days, as well as updating your to-do list, write a have-done list, because I think mindfulness is a really nice way to take that step back and kind of realize how far you have actually come. And for me, you know, once you start to see progress over the last few weeks, that's what sets you up for the momentum over the next few weeks too, right? So often when you write that have-done list, has anyone done the thing where you're writing a to-do list, and you deliberately write down things you have already done, <laughs> and you tick them off, yes, right? Um, but that is really useful in all seriousness, because what's that doing? It's, it's giving you a little hit of dopamine a little into the brain of like, I'm capable, I'm achieving stuff, you know? And what that does is give you a sense of momentum, right, give me the next thing. Dopamine's a very addictive chemical. Like, once you start to, to crave that next hit of like getting the next thing done, you're onto a positive frame of mind and a positive momentum. So, you know, just really recognizing that mindfulness will help you to, to get there and kind of give you that, that sense of being able to take a step back and kind of see that bigger picture. And then the final thing I just want to talk about is um, just something around productivity in general as a topic. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I was really sick. One of the reasons I wrote the book is I was really sick of all these uh, books that have these kind of guru narrators of like, I'm really perfect and like, just be more like me and it'll be great. And I do think there's... Um, uh, a real, uh, you know, like for me, there's something really quite toxic about that whole idea. And I started writing Productivity Ninja with this mindset of everybody screws this up, like regularly, including all the people that write books about it, and also that's okay. And, you know, I think we all need to be kind to ourselves to, to recognize when we do drop the ball or something goes wrong, um, that mistakes will happen and we will move on from that. And, you know, we need to define ourselves by the 99% of times we get it right not by the 1% of, of times that we get things wrong. Um, so a productivity ninja is a human, not a superhero. Um, I think productivity as a topic would be really, really boring if we could just automate everything and then robots could do everything. Like, I mean, it'd be quite nice for work-life balance, but it'd be really boring as a topic. And particularly coming to a thing that's action for happiness, like the thing that, kept, that was in my head uh, all day today uh, as I was kind of thinking about this talk was, you know the radio head thing that goes, fitter, happier, more productive. Like, it's just kind of boring, isn't it? Like, it's just a boring thing. So I think, for me, recognizing that we do all get tired. Um, it's a lovely African proverb, even the best dancers get tired, which I really like. Um, but recognizing that we have to uh, give ourselves those, those times to rest and relax and recuperate. Recognizing that we will make mistakes. And recognizing that we are all 
human beings with perhaps amazing skills and perhaps really good habits and zen-like calm and ruthlessness and we being weapon savvy and all these different things. We have all that in the bag and we look to everybody else in the office and everybody else in our organization like we might be some kind of superhero, but we're just a human with lots of good skills. And we don't have special powers. There's no easy way to do all this stuff. There's no kind of one-size-fits-all button we can press and everything's fine. But we're just humans doing good work. And I think for me, that's way more interesting than, than kind of focusing on this idea of perfection and, and trying to just use that to make everything right in the world. So I really encourage you to think about getting enough sleep. Think about how a lion operates. Like 90% of their time, they're asleep. And then they go and do the hunting, and then they need sleep again. Like We need to be kind to ourselves as humans. We need to give ourselves a break at certain times. We need to make sure that we're well rested. We need to make sure that we're well hydrated, that we eat well. All these kind of boring things your mum told you, they're all kind of true. Um, but we need to recognize that, that you know, when you're working with your brain and your brain is your, your best tool, then we need to kind of feed our brains with the right kind of stuff. And that's really important to kind of recognizing that sense of being human and humanness within productivity rather than kind of trying to slog our, our guts out and kind of treating ourselves like some kind of robot slave thing. Um, and sometimes that means just refreshing your mojo a little bit. Um, John D. Rockefeller, an American entrepreneur, uh, was once asked, what's, the secret, what's your secret of success? And he said it was booking theater tickets and sending thank you cards. And uh, the person asking him was like, huh, what's that about? And uh, it turned out that the booking theatre tickets was him realizing that as a human being, he would slump in the afternoon. But if he knew that he had to be out the door at 6 o'clock, hard deadline, because he had to meet his wife for dinner and then go to the theatre, that whole afternoon he was way more productive. So it's like recognizing that kind of human frailty that he had, where he wouldn't then be working till 7, 8 in the evening. It's like, I've got a deadline, I'm going to focus, that's my thing. And... Uh, sending thank you cards was a really wise observation of his, and it, of course it was about gratitude. It was also about recognizing that when you are John D. Rockefeller, there's kind of a power dynamic to every conversation you're having with anybody. So recognizing that writing thank you cards was a thing that he could do to kind of try and address that and be grateful and be visibly grateful for the stuff that was happening around him. Um, so just this idea of refreshing your mojo, getting out of uh, this kind of sense of, of, of slave driving ourselves, uh, you know, into burnout and like really recognizing and embracing the fact that to be productive, you actually have to be human too. I think it's really, really important. Um, so we're almost at the end. I'm going to put the uh, nine characteristics back up, up on the screen again. I'm going to give you another couple of minutes and then Mark is going to come up and we'll take some questions. So another couple of minutes just to wrap up really um, from what you've heard, what are you going to do differently as a result? So off you go. Thank you, whoever was down there. Like, Shh, really schooly down here. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, right, so um, that sort of concludes the talk part of the evening. Uh, but do stick around because uh, Mark is going to come up in a moment and we're going to do some QA. Uh, and also, I've got a couple of announcements at the end uh, for stuff that you might be in interested in subscribing to and things like that as well. Um, so, just before I bring Mark up, I just wanted to say that at the very beginning, I talked about this idea that. Uh, just realizing I'm totally in the way of everything there. Uh, I said at the beginning that we uh, no longer need to view time as our most precious resource and attention is your most precious resource. Um, so just before I bring Mark up, I just wanted to say a huge thank you for giving your attention to me so generously this evening and participating so fully in the discussions and all of that. So just thank you for your attention. Thank you. Graham, thank Please you keep so it going for Mark! Yay. Uh, <laughs> um, thank, you, thank you so much. I know this is one of these topics where loads of us are going to want to have different questions and ideas, and we want to carry that on. I'm going to slightly abuse my position on stage with a microphone to ask you a question I suspect will be of interest to lots of us, actually. So I, I love that thing you said at the beginning about like, defending your time and like, so you can focus on the important stuff, say no to stuff. And I think when you're saying no to like, a project idea that's not very good or uh, something that you, like, doesn't feel too painful, that's OK. But you know, what, what happens if that, that no is, as a parent, you've got your child going, Mommy, will you play with me? Or Daddy, can you come home from work earlier? Or if in a work context, you've genuinely got things like, that you're passionate about and are really important. How, how do you say no to the things that you do care about. I mean, saying no to the 
the irrelevant stuff's easy. Saying no to stuff where you're having to make choices between two really important things. How do you manage that? And how can you do that in a way that's human and effective? Yeah, so it's saying no. So there's the stuff where you really care. So I always want the answer uh, when it's me and my kid to always be, yes, I have time for you, right? So that's, that's a, the really difficult one. There's also the stuff where it's really important in someone else's world, but not necessarily yours. So it's like some... Like, uh, I'm sure many of us will, will get this where someone will contact you on LinkedIn and go, oh, can I just pick your brains for a bit or have coffee or, you know, like there's, there's that kind of stuff. Or can I pull you off the stuff that you're doing into my project team to work on this thing? And it's like you don't necessarily think it's the biggest part of your world, but you know it's so important to that person. So there's like those kind of bits in the middle as well. I would say that um, there's, a, there's a few things that you can do to, uh, to really help with that. And the first is to embrace the idea of no being a complete sentence, which is so un-British, right? That's like silence the room immediately. Um, and it's one of those things that's really hard to do. Um, I have found in the last couple of years, I've really started to embrace the idea of saying no, and I've got much better at it. And the first few times you do it, it's that lizard brain thing again, of like the butterflies in your stomach, like, can I really just send this email? Um, I'm like, weirdly for someone who uh, gets the sort of predominant part of my income from speaking, I'm a bit of an introvert. I don't really like, if you like, <laughs> like it would, that's my lizard brain battle all the time. Um, and being an author, you sort of get invited to these uh, like author parties and stuff. And it's just like loads of other introvert authors in the room all being really awkward, <laughs> right? And for the first couple of years, I thought that it was my duty to go to the event, like, even though I really didn't enjoy it and whatever, because I really felt like that's what you do when you're an author. And then I then went through a phase of saying no because there was an excuse. So I'd say, oh, I'm not in London that day. Or something like that. And now I literally just go, I don't really enjoy those, so no. <laughs> Um, and it feels like really weird when you first do it, but like, you know, sorry, that's just not a thing that I want to do, is, is fine you know, as, as an answer. Um, I think there's a few other ways too. So when you, uh, if you're less uh, like bullish about uh, taking on that one, I think that's one that you use circumstantially and sparingly. Um, one of the things that's really useful is having a really good project list and to-do list for when your boss comes to your desk and has the superhero moment with you. We've all been there, right? It's like... Graham, can you drop everything right now and focus on this one thing that's like my biggest priority right now? And you're sat there and you know all the stuff that's in your head and you have three seconds of going, oh no. And then you have the moment of going, but I want to be the superhero person. I want to be, so you go, da -da -da, yes, of course. I want to and then you worry about it later. So when that person comes to your desk, being able to say, these are the projects that I have going on. This is the stuff that I've got on my plate right now. You show me where this fits, right? So then it becomes an objective renegotiation of what's on your plate rather than a subjective judgment of you not being able and capable enough to take on stuff that you don't have time to do and it's just going to you know, put you closer to burnout. So that sense of like, one of the things I didn't talk about too much um, was uh, in preparedness, I talked I talk about this idea of um, the weekly checklist. So having a really good checklist that you go through once a week to help you do thinking. And one of the things in there is just like looking project by project, all the stuff I'm committed to, like where's it at, is it behind schedule, what's the next action on each of those things. And you know, just having that, that discipline around that means that my second brain really is a good, uh, you know, it's, it's a good reflection of what's in my life and what's important in my life. Like I can see it in the app right there. And that gets updated through that checklist process like once a week. So it's always a pretty good uh, sense of things. And that is not only the best way and the best tool in those moments to, to put that in front of somebody and say no, it's also a really good reminder if you're doing that regularly when other stuff pops up for you to say, actually, this is something I'm going to have to say no to because I know really clearly all the other stuff that's in my world. Um, Paolo Coelho, who wrote The Alchemist, uh, said, when you say yes to other people, make sure you're not saying no to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's about really recognizing what is on your plate, what is vital to you, like having a sense of purpose and priority around this stuff. Um, so there's that kind of way. Uh, another way is to uh, think about personal policies. I found this one really helpful. So when you get the thing of, um, can you give time to this pro bono thing, or can, you, uh, can I pick your brains over a cup of tea, or can you come into London and do this thing, or all those kind of things, which I want to do some of them. I literally can't do all of them. 
And if I did all of them, I would be neglecting lots of stuff that really matters. So I now have these kind of personal policies around, I'm in London two days a month. These are the two days. If it fits in there, cool. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to do it. And so it's the personal policy that's saying, no, not me. Because sometimes it's this kind of ego sense that we have of, like, we don't want to let people down. So being able to say, oh, that's my policy, sorry. It's the same with pro bono stuff. Like, I do a lot of that stuff, but I also have a thing, which is, like, I'm fully committed on my pro bono days right now or my charity donations right now, whatever that might be. It's a much easier way of saying no because it's, like, the policy saying no rather than you saying no. Mm. So those are like a few ways. I'm kind of also intrigued to maybe just throw the question out. When I do workshops around this stuff, I often find that, um, th you know, particularly in kind of organizational context, there's kind of certain things in organizations where people just have like way better answers than me. So maybe someone's got like an even better answer than what I've just given. Um, so has anyone got like just a tip around how to say no? Like, and then this is like totally putting you all on the spot now. No one's going to put your hand up on you. Yes, thank you. Um, you win a prize uh, for being the first person to, uh, to contribute this evening, uh, and your prize is a huge round of applause. Because that is a brave thing to do, right? That's a lizard brain thing of like, oh, don't look at me. Well, we're now looking at you, so it's fine. Now I'm terrified, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think saying no, not now, but mm. this is when, when do you need it by and... Um, then I suppose it goes into what you were saying about having a renegotiation um, with someone sort of saying, well, where does it fit in? But actually, where, you know, how feasible is that? Do they need, if I can do it in a week, I could do it in a week, but I can't do it today. I think that's something that's really helped me out, particularly in my job where I have to juggle a lot of stuff with a lot of yeah. people. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And I think also, just to build on that one, is um, clarifying what the yes would be as well, so you know, like if you if you're you kind of want to say no, you're tempted to say no. What is the opposite of that? What's the alternative? Like, how much time is this going to take? What is the commitment here? Like, are they clear? Because often, particularly when it's someone coming to you at the last minute, they don't really know like how deep you're going to be in if you say yes to it. So like, you know, batting it back rather than saying yes or no, like like you say, renegotiating it, but also scoping it as well as maybe moving the timeline um, further down the park. Um, the other one which I think is worth uh, saying just around trying to encourage you to say no more is people would much rather you said no straight away than to just keep saying yeah but delaying it and never delivering it, right? People really respect it more. And I've had this where I've uh, reached out to a couple of like, I guess like fellow authors and kind of people for advice and for their time and stuff. And I've had a couple of people turn me down, but do so in such a gracious way that my learning from it was like, oh, someone can go up in your estimation even when they say no. And that's true of you too. Because I think often we feel like it's always a zero-sum game. Like, we're always going to lose by saying no. Actually, you can go up in someone's estimation by saying no if you do it gracefully and politely and with really good reason as well. So I think that's a really mm. good thing to oh, add. Great in. point. Thank you. And thanks for the contribution. Um, just on the subject of that um, email that we all love so much, I, I was intrigued by your distinction between one end of the spectrum, inbox zero, and uh, the other end, which I, I read about also this weekend in the papers about this kind of in, inbox infinity, kind of all completely overloaded. I was kind of intrigued in the room where we're at on that spectrum. So yeah. um, if you yeah. had to choose, would you say, by show of hands, you're closer to inbox zero on a regular basis? Okay, nice. look at these people, wow. That's or closer perfect. to like inbox infinity, please make it stop, I'm drowning in like constant email. But actually that might be a, a kind of type of zen in its own way. Okay, mm. I, I, I was very much in that latter category um, a few years back, 27,000 emails in my inbox, I think it was. Um, and then partly thanks to Graham and colleagues, have, have begun using Inbox Zero and found it really, really helpful and really transformative. But I've noticed there were some little tips around managing stuff that can be quite helpful. So I, I love people who have these quirky out-of-office replies that kind of go, I'm on holiday, I'm relaxing, you should too. I may reply when I get back, but probably not. So if it's important, let me know in two weeks' time. Or something, and I'm like, I couldn't write that. But, but actually, there's something intriguing about that because you know, I always remember a colleague of mine came back and they'd lost their entire inbox because there'd been a server failure. And he said it was the best coming back from holiday ever. Because if, <laughs> if it was important, people got back in touch and I yeah. didn't like, come back feeling like I'd lost all my holidayness in the first hour. Um, so have you got any other kind of like hints and tips around getting more sane with this rather daft thing that's in our lives called email? Yeah, it just reminded me of um, I did a talk last week at a, a very big tech company and uh, one of the guys as part of the Q&A said, uh, his boss had said to him, if you don't want me to look at something, send me an email. 
Uh, but I think there's, uh, I think a lot of this also depends on the culture of organizations. So uh, we work with organizations where the expectation is every five minutes you've got to be replying. And sometimes that expectation is not really clarified. So you've got certain people in the organization who really feel like this pressure to be constantly on email. And then certain other people in the same organization who are like, oh, no, no, that was never the expectation. When you really you know, get people to put these things on the table and debate it and really think about what the policy should be or what the, what the ways of working that are most effective would look like, people have very different ideas about it. So I think the culture of email is a really important part of it too. Um, I am a big believer in kind of scheduling uh, time to do email. I think, like most things, Email is much better done in short bursts where you batch process it. And that's really what the, the inbox zero idea is about. It's not about it always being at zero. It's about saying, right, I'm going to leave it for three or four hours. So it's kind of like the inbox infinity thing. I'm going to neglect email for three or four hours. And then when I come back in, bang, I'm just going to get it all the way back down to zero. And what's lovely about that is you go in four hours later, and some people have had a whole you know, furious conversation. And then you can just read the last email, and it tells you kind of what to do. Um, so it actually does save some time. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, those out-of-office type ideas, like, as long as you're clear, you know, no one minds. If you've got a day of training and you have an out-of-office on that says, I'm away for the day because I'm on training, no one minds if you have a lunch hour, no one minds if you're in a meeting for three hours. So the idea that every other minute you need to be, like, sat as a slave to your email, I think is just, like, it's like being busy is a state of mind. It's that kind of thing. It's all in our head, really. And... You know, starting to reclaim our attention around those things, I think, is really important. So having a, a good, clear sense of boundaries around that, having some set times in your week around that, um, putting it into your calendar. I see so many people who the calendar is full of back-to-back -back meetings, and none of those meetings say, now's the time to do email. So what that means is you have all the back-to-back -back meetings, and then you get to the end of the day, and you've just got loads of email. Um, so, you know, recognizing that it is a part of our job, it is something that we need to make the time and space for, and doing that habitually in a batch process way, rather than kind of having it on all the time and it just being a constant interruption. Oh, and turn off notifications if you haven't done it already. Like, it will change your life. Like, just change the, all the little notification settings you can change uh, in Microsoft Outlook and Gmail. Don't have those pings coming up. Don't have those little flashing things in the corner of the screen. And just even that, you'll notice such a boost in productivity as a result of that. Yeah, thank you. Now, I've been dominating this, I'm apologies. So who would like to ask a question? We've got microphones. We may have to take a question shout out from upstairs. But by show of hands, let's see where people would like to ask Graham something or make a comment. Let's try and keep these um, succinct if we can. So yeah, Jay, this gentleman here first. And then we'll come to Will in the jumper here. Thanks. Um, so I found, well, all, in, all of seven or eight that we went through really interesting. but. The zen-like calm um, aspect I thought was particularly interesting and I was just wondering, I often find that one of the biggest obstacles to me getting things done is that I find like a real difficulty to master like energy and enthusiasm for things I particularly don't care about, like tasks I don't care about at work. Um, <laughs> stuff that I'm passionate about, yeah, great, I'll go into yeah. the cows go home. But I was wondering what kind of things um, you find help get you into flow state most? Uh, do you mean in particular around the stuff that I don't love doing? or Either, do either or. If, if, it's, if it varies depending on whether you enjoy it or not, then... Yeah. yeah, I think what I said before about the the lizard brain and its relation to how you think about those different things, I think for me is a huge part of it, personally. So looking at my to-do list and noticing which ones make me wince, which ones make me feel tense, like that's always a really good indication of I might need some kind of other strategy around that. I think it's, and it, it's an intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation kind of issue. So for me, the stuff that feels tedious or it feels scary or difficult or it doesn't feel like very well defined and you know, I, I need to kind of work on, um, what I tend to try and do is put a deadline in somebody else's world. So what I mean by that is uh, if it's I've got to deliver this report and it kind of feels really dirty and I don't really want to do it, I will send an email to someone going, I will have this with you by 5 o'clock on Friday, right? And so I make a very public declaration um, or, or you know, a sort of email declaration. That what that means is I'm now committed to it. So it becomes, you know, the deadline is the motivation around that stuff. But what I want to do as much as possible is not have everything motivated by deadlines. So the other side to that is where I can iron out those creases and, and not feel that fear around it or... I can sort of change that in my own head, then I will do. So that could be as simple as 
if something feels scary because it's not very well defined, then I change my, my next physical action around it from be, on my to-do list, literally, it, it will no longer say, start the thing, it will say, get some advice from so-and-so about the thing. You know, so like making the action something which is about defining it and getting the skills that I need or whatever, so that I can then have intrinsic motivation and kind of really feel like I'm clear on what I'm doing, if that makes sense. So I think sometimes just when you're not as well defined, it's easier to procrastinate and, and harder to get momentum. Um, and then, yeah, and, and even so, even when you've got stuff that you're really motiv motivated about and you really want to do, for example, the book I'm supposed to be writing at the moment, uh, it can be really difficult to get into that flow state. So I think for me particularly, that's again around uh, some of the manipulation of phones around apps and kind of keeping phone as a distraction technique. It's about talking to colleagues to make sure that they know when are my writing times and when are my head, heads down kind of times. Family, friends, you know, it's kind of like managing the, all of those different boundaries. So there's often you have a good set of principles around two or three of those, but there's like one thing that's the leaky one or the one thing that you really need to mm. spend some time Re, like re-engineering or kind of changing to make it work, if that makes sense, like out of all those different variables. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So let's come down here, and then who else would like to ask a question? Let's see where we go next. Great. And then if you could pass it on to this chap in front of you afterwards, well, that'd be great. Okay. So. Thanks very much for your chat. It's been really interesting. I had a couple of things. The first one was on the email, which I thought was just worth sharing. There's, um, I'm sure a few of you know this, but there are ways to kind of get your your company to manage email better for you. Um, a really good example was Daimler in Germany, who, when you go on holiday, they send an automatic email to anyone who's emailed you and says, thanks very much for email. The person you emailed is on holiday. This email will be deleted. They will not see it. And you need to email this person if you want to get your stuff done. And I think that's an amazing cultural yeah. way of a business being able to manage their staff's time off. And I think that's you know, an important thing that perhaps we could push as a society to, sure. to do because there's nothing worse than being on holiday and you know wanting to be on your smartphone like you say and then you've got that ridiculous OCD you check mail and you've got 100 emails your whole holiday's ruined so that's an interesting I guess observation um, and then on the no thing I just wanted to ask you a question I find that kind of the no saying no is it's a quite good spin on it if you can say yes there's things that you never say no to so, for example, I think that the productivity thing comes from feeling guilty that you haven't done enough things in the day, so you feel bad. But there should be things in your head where you never say no. So, for example, if your kids come and ask, can we hang out with you? Nothing takes more priority than that. And therefore, you don't feel guilty, so therefore you feel like you've been productive. And that's, I just think, is a tweak in the brain that mm. instead of just thinking about saying no, maybe thinking about there's some things in your life that you never say no to. So that was just mm. some stuff. I love that. Um... It also just made me think as well that, so with, one thing that people often don't have in their projects list is being a good dad or being a good parent or whatever. And I think sometimes even just recognizing that that is a really big priority, but then managing it in the same way, right? So when I look at my weekly checklist, it's like one of the things that comes up, you know, I have like the role of author, I have the role of dad, like all these things come up. And when I look at those, I then have to work out what does that mean over the next week and how do I manage my calendar around that. And I've just found that just to really, like, takes half a minute a week to do that thinking, but it just allows me probably to get to what you put so beautifully and succinctly, succinctly with it. I can't even say succinctly, that's, that's really bad. Um, but, you know, just that idea of, of, like, what's the thing you never say no to, I think, is a really powerful thing. I'm always going to say yes to that thing. I think that's huge. And just on that, yeah. so I started using the Nosby app that you mentioned earlier when I came across this stuff. And the thing I find really helpful, which I know you encourage as well, is once a week doing a big review of all that stuff, but also every day just going, okay, well, I thought this was the stuff I was going to do today, but actually the world's changed. And I can quite easily go, no, actually, that is more important than a family thing has come up or that's not happening now. And it allows you to sort of be flexible and not get stuck on doing something you said you were going to do, but actually turns out to be less relevant now. Yeah. That's yeah. really helpful. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, any upstairs? Yes. Um, you might have to shout out, unless there is a microphone up there. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to come to this man here. Sorry, now he started shouting. Let's go and hear what he was saying. Sorry. <laughs> Hello? About the characteristic or just about the picture? It's cool, right? Yeah. So I had a designer called Alan Burrell who helped me with all of these. Um, I particularly enjoyed when I did number five. I literally said to him, do a ninja, but a bit like Inspector Gadget, and he came up with number five. <laughs> He's a genius. Um, but number six is about agility, so it's about um, recognizing that there's always going to be times where as much autonomy as you might have in your own planning, 
There'll be things where you need to drop everything and go and fight that fire, deal with that emergency. And agility is really about how can we uh, be ready to spring into action when those things happen, and also how can we recover as quickly as possible. Often the problem when you, you, know, you get derailed and everything gets dropped because there's something else is then, you know, like at the end of that, you just feel fatigued and you're a bit like, where were we again? What else am I supposed to be doing? So again, having that clarity around projects and, 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 and your master actions list, um, which is all the stuff that's in the book, um, really huge around that. Um, the other thing that I talk about within agility, it's a really nice little um, sort of mantra to, uh, to think about as well, is uh, all the old time management books talk about the idea of multitasking as like it's the holy grail. Like, if you multitask, then it'll all be great, because it feels right. It feels like doing two things at the same time must be better. Um, actually, it's totally the opposite of that. All the psychology is uh, you get more done when you monotask and when you focus on one thing at a time. So part of agility is kind of recognizing how to, how to monotask serially, right? So I'm working on one thing till it's finished, then the next thing till it's finished. That's what agility looks like, not I'm spinning 27 different plates all day and none of them actually get done. Um, so I think, you know, thinking about how do you monotask, how do you have uh, a, a desktop screen or a desktop in front of you where you only have information related to that one project or that one thing in front of you, not 57 different windows open, not 20 different bits of paper on the desk. Like, monotasking really is about keeping your attention to only have that one thing on your mind at that point. Um, and, you know, just that idea of monotasking rather than multitasking uh, can be a really useful lens to, to kind of approach a day, especially when you've got a lot on. Yeah, thank you. Now, I very rudely, completely forgotten I said you were next. So <laughs> Hello. Apologies. Over to you. Now. Um, my question is about optimum length of to-do list. Mm -hmm. um, I have a tendency of writing incredibly long, incre incredibly com comprehensive, detailed to-do lists, which when I first do them, I think, awesome, I feel relaxed for about a second, and I see the vastness of this list. Does, does one of your points say, see other to-do lists? Pretty much, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so, and then that can, you know, psychologically, just, it's yeah. like sort of this cloud around that, you know, you feel like you have to attend to all the time, which then isn't particularly productive because, you know, often it's just a thought dump. So, I mean, I obviously do prioritise, but just almost like visually the number of words and information in it is just in of itself like terrifying. So what, do you have any tips on like, you know, maybe some things shouldn't go into the to-do list in the first place or to actually make it something that you can look at and it sort of feels less overwhelming? Yeah, so, so your question was, what's the optimum number of things on, on the to-do list? And the answer is, it depends who you're asking, right? So if you're asking your worker self, or your boss self, it's a different answer, right? If you're asking your, your, your boss self, the, the boss part of your brain is about doing all the thinking, doing all the clarifying. The optimum level of the do list is the number of things that you're committed to doing. Full stop, right? You need to have all of those things on a master actions list. You need to have a project around each of those things. And that will help you once a week to do that kind of deep dive thinking. What that then means is, very happily on the other end of that, is the rest of the time is putting chairs on cakes. It's being a worker, right? It's boss and worker. So when you're in that putting chairs on cakes mode, the way I do it is I have my huge, big Nosby app with literally everything and it's endless and it can be maddening when you look at it like in, in that sense as you talked about. But what I do is I then write down on one small post-it note, not the oblong ones, the square ones, the really small ones. And you can only fit a few things on there. And just having that constraint of five or six things um, I find really helpful because then it's like five or six cherries. I know how to put five or six cherries on cakes. It's really simple. So I think the question is, you know, it comes from uh, that anxiety when you're half, you know, one foot in boss mode and one foot in worker mode. And actually what we've got to do is like separate those two things out. And, you know, the, the thinking time is about defining everything. And then really ultimately so that when, we're, when we want to be in do mode, we want to get stuff done. Like just give me the stuff that I need to do today. Like I don't even think about the other stuff. Like, I do a couple of hours of very deep dive, project level, strategic level thinking once a week. Most of the rest of my week, I don't need to think that much, actually, because it's like, it's pretty clear what's going to come up. It's pretty clear what's there. There'll be other things that I react to, but I don't really get into strategic, like, think mode, you know, sort of um, project kind of mode very often. Like, it's like, do that really well once a week. You don't have to do it every day. Mm. So I think that's really where a lot of that anxiety comes from. And, and the thing that changed my life on this topic, because I had the longest to list in the world, and it used to you know, break my heart every time I looked at it, um, was um, turning into day-based um, 
uh, to-do list. So in, in Nosby, I, I, I have, like, these are things I'm doing today. If I put out the entirety of what's in there for over the next two months, it'd be, like, more than I could possibly cope with. But I've only got five of them on the list for today, and then there's seven tomorrow, and there's, you know, and that really helped me go lose that fear of, like, oh, my God, there's so much to do. Um, we, you wanted to make some announcements. I had one quick announcement to make, and we kind of we promised to let people go at half past eight. So I think we're going to have to wrap up there. So before we show our appreciation again for Graham, I'd just like to invite you to share whatever it is you're going to share, and then I'll make an announcement, and then yeah, we can sure. wrap up. So. Um, so just a couple of things. If you are interested in uh, spending a day geeking out <laughs> and actually revamping your productivity, uh, then I'm going to be doing a masterclass event um, it's going to be at the uh, Business Design Center on Upper Street in Islington. Uh, it's in March. So if you want to find out about that, um, it's literally, it's not even on Eventbrite yet, so you need to email me. Um, not so only is it in March, it's actually on the International Day of Happiness, the 20th. Is of that March. true? Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> UN International Day. Of course event. I planned that, right? Uh, <laughs> Um, so if you're interested in that event, um, you just need to email me or you can social media DM me and then I will send you the details as soon as it goes live next week. Um, but that's on the 20th of March in London. Um, and then if you want the details of how to do that, so on Instagram and on Twitter, I'm just at Graham Alcott. So just at Graham Alcott. Uh, DM me on either of those. That's cool. And if you want to email me, it's just graham at thinkproductive.co.uk. So that's how to get hold of me. I'm also, by the way, like if I didn't get to your question and you've got like some geeky question that you really want to know my thoughts on, then just, like, just send me an at reply um, rather than a DM afterwards because then other people will get to see the response. Um, but just happy to answer questions and I'm, I'm going to hang around afterwards as well. Um, and then other stuff. So if you want us to come into your company, um, we have a company called Think Productive. We go into businesses around the world and we do workshops around some of the stuff I've talked about. So that's thinkproductive.com, thinkproductive.co.uk. You'll find out about that. Uh, my podcast is called Beyond Busy. So I have conversations with a whole range of different people in different uh, job roles. I've actually had Mark on the podcast as well before. Um, so if you just look up Beyond Busy in whatever your podcast app of choice. Uh, and then we have books for sale at the back. I'm happy to sign them with naggy messages to your other half saying, clean the garage out, or whatever it might be. Um, so happy to do that. Uh, and I'll stay around and answer questions at the end as well. So um, email me if you want to know about the masterclass. Um, at reply me if you want to, uh, me to answer some questions. And that's it from me. Thank you. Oh, thank you.